Welcome to TEDWIC 2020 and the Symposium 1, uh, which is Standards Alignment, which and how. My name is Anton Günsch. I'm your moderator. My co-moderator is David Fichtmüller. And I want to thank your colleague, Mareike Peterson and Brenda Daly for providing technical support for this session. Before going into the program, I have to make a couple of announcements, which you probably already know from other sessions. Uh, here we go. The session will be recorded for later viewing. Please keep this in mind when you open your mic uh, and or enable your webcam, for example, when asking a question. The chat function has been made available for communicating with the whole group or specific attendees. Please use the chat function thoughtfully. Inappropriate use of the chat may result in you being removed from the session or the chat being disabled altogether. In general, please follow the code of conduct, which you find on uh, this slide, uh, or you can directly use the link in the chat, I believe. Um, contributions can be made in several ways. There's a document for collaborative notes. There is the chat for asking questions discussing on the topics. And uh, if you want to say something, please use the raise hand icon, which you will find at the bottom of the participants list. Then please wait until you will be called and don't forget to unmute the mic. I think that's it. And uh, we can start with the program. This symposium is practically um, part two of a workshop of the ABCD uh, Darwin Core Alignment Group, which was coordinated by David uh, Fichtmüller uh, during the TEDWIC working week uh, in September. And uh, we would like to use this symposium to present and uh, discuss some of the results. Um, but we also have uh, a, so to speak, uh, external submission by uh, Filippi Suarez. Uh, about linking agrobiodiversity data through metadata standards, which I believe uh, involves activities for aligning different existing standards. And uh, it is therefore the perfect starter for our symposium, I think. So uh, please, Filippi, uh, do you want to share your screen and make your presentation? Okay, thank you, Anton. So here we go. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, very well. Thank you. So, hi everybody. My name is Filippi. I am a PhD student. Uh, I just started the PhD at the University of Sao Paulo. And uh, I am doing this research in partnership with the Brazilian Agricultural Research Corporation. And uh, we intend to present at the end of the research, a data model to describe agricultural biodiversity data. And uh, I think it's important to be here participating in this symposium because of course there are many standards that can be useful to connect and use to represent and describe agricultural biodiversity data. Well, starting for the definition, agricultural biodiversity uh, is basically defined by the, the Convention on Biological Diversity as all the elements and components of biodiversity that are relevant somehow to uh, food production and agriculture or any other economic activity. And so we can think about also the relationship between these components with the environment and with the production systems, and as it's called agroecosystems. Well, and so why is agriculture biodiversity important? Here we have five uh, highlighted roles by the FAO report. And the first of them, ecosystem services, is basically about all the services that uh, biodiversity can provide to um, the production systems, but also to the society. And so here we can think about uh, pro uh, provi provisioning and supporting regulating services like pollination uh, and biological control, but also uh, indirect services like uh, water cycle and soil nutrient cycle, for example. And we also have um, the cultural surfaces. Uh, if, you, if we think about 
traditional communities around the world that uses uh, that use resources from biodiversity in their traditional rituals and stuff like that. And uh, we have also sustainable intensification as a, as a very important role of agricultural biodiversity. As we know, important traits from uh, wild uh, relatives of crops and livestock can be used to improve the, the resilience and even the production of this uh, species. And of course, the traits from um, local breeds are also very important. So, uh, and there are many other examples, examples that we could use here in sustainable intensification. And we also have the livelihoods as very important, especially for people with low incomes in developing countries, as they showed in the report, uh, basically because these people can take uh, resources from ecosystems like timber, uh, clear water, and even food by collecting them from the ecosystems. So uh, it's also very important for uh, these communities. And the resilience to specific threats, as I said before, um, we can take advantage of specific traits of wild relatives uh, from biodiversity to improve the resilience of cultivated species. But we can also think about the importance of the ecosystem to provide shelter to species and even to protect from natural disasters. And uh, the last one, food security and nutrition, uh, it uh, has been shown to be very important, especially for communities with low incomes, once again, in developing countries, because if they don't have, uh, as many of them don't have enough resources to buy food, they can take part of their diet from the biodiversity, from the ecosystems by collecting or fishing or hunting, etc. So. Uh, here is the last uh, topic of importance of agricultural biodiversity. Of course, this is a very uh, brief presentation and you can find more details of each of these uh, roles and importance of agricultural biodiversity in this report published by the FAO last year. Uh, this is a very strong reference for uh, people studying agricultural biodiversity because it has data from many countries about the use of agricultural biodiversity. And you can download it for free in the FAO website or just follow this uh, DOI number. Well, and based on this report, we are developing a framework that we believe will be helpful to uh, connect the data of agricultural biodiversity, which I am going to show right now. Well, uh, basically, the structure of this uh, conceptual model is still, is still very simple because, uh, as I told, I am the beginning of the research. But uh, we expect to deliver it, uh, like uh, a conceptual model, a uh, controlled vocabulary for agricultural biodiversity at the end of the research. For now, we have this uh, mind map in the CMAP tools. Uh, it is available in the GitHub repository, which the link is in the abstract published in the Biodiversity and Information Science and Standards related to this presentation. And well, basically here we have uh, these concepts there, and the relationship between them. We also uh, are describing these relationships because we believe it's going to be easier to create this uh, vocabulary, this controlled vocabulary at the end. Well. I am not going over each of these concepts here because it's actually not the purpose of my presentation. But as I said before, you can just download the full version of this mind map at the GitHub. And uh, of course, uh, as I update this mind map, I release the new version there. So you can just keep the track of this uh, releases in the GitHub. So now coming back to my, to my PowerPoint. Well, and of course, there are many uh, standards that we can use and we can uh, connect to describe agricultural biodiversity data. For example, Biodiversity International has a huge list of descriptors to describe uh, crop data. And of course, we believe that we can connect them uh, using that framework that we are developing. And you can download these descriptors in the PTF format in uh, Biodiversity International website. And here we have four broad uh, descriptors standards for uh, to describe data of, of crops. 
we are going to, I am going to talk about this three uh, first here. I'm not going to talk about this, this cryptos for genetic mark technologies because it's not very in the scope of my research right now, but maybe in future uh, I can uh, come to study uh, genetic resources to relate to this agricultural biodiversity data schema. Well, and of course, Darwin Core is also a very important standard to describe agricultural biodiversity data, as we can take advantage of all these uh, cores to describe species, to describe specimen and occurrence of, spe of species in nature, to describe data about uh, species that are relevant somehow to uh, agrobiodiversity. And well, in this first standard uh, of biodiversity uh, international, to describe crop wild relatives. We have uh, some resemblance between this standard and Darwin Core, we, uh, which we can take advantage of to, uh, in our conceptual model to uh, bite them together, to use them together. But here we have something uh, a little bit different because in this crop, uh, crop wild relatives, we have this population class, which um, we don't have so many uh, properties in Darwin Core, in the main core of Darwin Core to describe uh, this kind of resource. I think, uh, I still think it's a little bit complicated to uh, represent population because um, when I think of Darwin Core, uh, most of the time we are representing like data of a specimen or, or about occurrence of some uh, species in nature. And uh, when, I, when I think about metadata, I have uh, uh, in one to one relationship, I have one metadata record to represent one resource. So when I talk, when I think about population, I have like many organisms here being represented at the same time. So we still need to figure it out how to represent this in our conceptual model. So uh, at the end of the presentation, if you have any suggestions about how to do that, it would be really nice to hear. Well. It's the same with this other uh, broad standards published by the Budget International. We can see some resemblance between them and Darwin Core. So uh, I think it would not be a problem to use them together to uh, complete this conceptual model, model we are doing. Uh, here we have, uh, once again, some differences between this uh, descriptors for farmers' knowledge of plants. Of course, the descriptors to um, describe traditional knowledge that people have about plants. We don't have so many concepts in the main core of Darwin Core, so we could take advantage of these uh, descriptors. And of course, relative, relative abundance uh, is another concept that uh, is not direct in this uh, main core of Darwin Core. And here the same thing, but in this FAO Biodiversity Multiple Passport, we have uh, more uh, classes of descriptors, but they are not very uh, separated. We cannot identify like the classes of concepts as we have in Darwin Core. So uh, it, it's a little bit, uh, you have to think that by looking this, all these uh, descriptors there, but we still believe that we could use them all together. Well, some of these uh, descriptors published by the Budget International are uh, also published as ontologies in the crop ontology. So uh, this way, it's much more easier to use them, to connect them as linkage data with other vocabularies and even with our model. But uh, not all of them have this uh, ontology related. So uh, maybe we still have to do this work to uh, when we are using these standards uh, to connect them together to describe agricultural biodiversity data. And well, uh, as final considerations, we expect to deliver something useful for the whole community to use to describe agricultural biodiversity data. And as I said, this research is still in the very beginning. So uh, thank you everybody. It's a great opportunity to be here participating uh, in TED Week uh, again. And it's always a great opportunity to have your feedback on, on the research. So. If you have any comments or suggestions or questions, I'd be, I would be really glad to hear. Thank you. 
Okay, many thanks, Filippi, for this uh, wonderful presentation. I, I have to look into the chat whether I can find questions. Uh, David Fichtmüller asks, um, besides population information, were there other concepts that were missing in Darwin Core slash ABCD? Well, uh, I believe other concepts there, uh, but I'm still analyzing uh, each of these concepts because they have so many uh, descriptors in each document. So uh, I just made this general, uh, I just give this overview in these descriptors. And I think that uh, when I move forward in the research, I will, I will be able to detect all these uh, descriptors that are missing in these both standards. Okay, are there more questions? I have, I, I'm seeing one, well, it's, it's moving all the time, from Natalia Ivanova. What is the relative abundance? I think organism quantity and organism quantity type are possible for description of these data. Yeah, actually, looking to uh, these descriptors in their, in, in their standard, yeah, they are quite similar to uh, these uh, elements in Darwin Core, but they have more elements there. Maybe I could show it here. I'm not sure if I am with this document open here right now, but they have more details about uh, the, the presence of these organisms in the ecosystems. So, yeah, maybe. Darwin Core could be useful to represent part of this data, but not all of them. Okay, thank you. I, I have another question more, more about the, the modeling process. You mentioned uh, that you were using mind maps to represent the conceptual model. And my question would be, uh, why are you using mind maps? And did you consider other techniques as well what what was the reason well uh i think that mind map is uh one easy tool to create uh, this conceptual model at the beginning because it let me free to uh create this relationship and it's very easy to use but uh, i expect to publish the the vocabulary in other formats uh, after i release the last version Okay, thank you. Um, I have to look into the chat. Well, I, I would have another question myself, uh, which um, which is that I I, I understood that the um, the original descriptor descriptions, so to speak, were in in textual form in a PDF in PDFs basically. Um, are you planning to um, transform these into some machine readable representation as well to make the link between the new model and the, the existing models? Yeah, perfect. This is the idea. So these descriptors that are just in PDF, the idea is to put them in uh, a relational uh, model so we can reuse it in our vocabulary. So maybe to publish like uh, an ontology so we can connect these concepts, but of course, giving the right reference to the original source. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I think um, I can see more questions. If you have more questions, just put them into the document and we can come back to this later. I believe you have plenty of time. Um, I think we can then move on to um, David and the report from the alignment workshop in September. Yes. Uh, hold on a Thanks, Philippi. Once more, it was very interesting. So, um, yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. Um, I'm David Wichtmüller and I'm here, as Anton already said, to 
give a report on the workshop we had in September during the TEDBIC workshop week of the ABCD Darwin Core Alignment Working Group. Um, I, since we are so many people here in this room, I thought I yeah might step back a bit and uh, for those who are new in the community, give a brief overview. Um, ABCD, which is short for Access to Biological Collection Data, but it's hardly ever spelled out in the full name, and Darwin Core, commonly abbreviated as DWC, um, are two of the most prominent TEDRIC standards. They've been around for quite a while and have yeah, gone through several changes and iterations. Both of them uh, cover similar topics uh, in the range of occurrence and um, uh, collection data but have uh, slightly different approaches. So if we uh, consider this, this graph on the x-axis, we have the technical restrictiveness going from like simple list of terms um, to yeah, somewhat connected concepts um, using semantics to a really rigid and fixed structure. And on the y-axis, we have the number of terms then um, traditionally Darwin core was in the lower left corner um, as the name implied the core concepts or the only the, the, the most important ones that are yeah, common for all kinds of data um, as a just defined list of terms which can then be packaged in various formats most commonly the star schema and in the other corner at the um, top right, we have ABCD, which is an, XSD, an XML schema, so an XSD file um, underneath that really strictly defines the rules and, and the rigid structure. And it has a lot of concepts. So on ABCD2, we have around 1,400 different addressable elements uh, in terms of different X paths within the XML tree. But uh, things change and those standards evolve uh, over time. More and more terms were added to Darwin Core and there were, are now a lot of extensions as well. And there's an RDF guide on how to express Darwin Core as RDF, thus moving Darwin Core in a bit more in the center. And for ABCD, we had the ABCD CD3 project um, where we yeah, took the XML schema and kind of broke it up a bit. We reduced the complexity and the number of concepts and made this into an ABCD ontology. We still have ABCD3 XML, which is somewhat close to the original ABCD2 XML. Um, but yeah, both concepts now move closer together and um, yeah, are behaving well, similarly and, and occupying the same space within this graph. So uh, the idea was since they're, they have gotten closer, maybe there's an opportunity to align them better. So um, this was an idea that was yeah, initiated by Stan Bloom in May last year. And there was a call um, with a lot of participants um, from yeah, all over the TEDVIC community, um, mostly focused on ABCD and Darwin Core, but not only, also from other related standards. And it uh, was, was an interesting and fruitful discussion. And the general consensus was, yes, an alignment of those standards would be greatly beneficial to the entire TEPIC community. Um, and there were some discussions in the weeks after on, on the email list, um, most notably a blog post by Steve Baskoff that uh, where he compared the ABCD model to Darwin Core. Um, I'm sorry, I didn't um, pick out the, uh, the link. Maybe somebody can post it in the chat. Um, and the work from, ah, thanks, <laughs> of course, Steve. Uh, um, uh, and the work of that group was then presented last year at Biodiversity Next in Leiden. And then not much happened within the group until uh, it was time to start planning the TEDVIC workshop week. And this was when we said, okay, we, we need to continue on this topic. And um, yeah, uh, so we, we had this workshop. Um, I have linked the, the document of the notes and the discussions we had there. 
Um, but yeah, you don't need to read through the entire document now because I'm here to give you the, the brief summary. Uh, so what was the scope of the workshop? Well, first we had a couple of problems, most notably that this ABCD Darwin core alignment was a really big task that was only vaguely defined. I guess everybody had kind of different understanding what this might mean and what this might entail. And we only had two hours for a workshop. So it was clear that this is not enough to do like any actual work. So instead we choose to A, give some homework. Um, so prior to the workshop, we sent around an email to the people who um, were, took part in the first uh, yeah, phone call and uh, asked them for use cases of ABCD and Darwin Core especially the ones that are the, the, the edge cases where um, there are issues with the standards, where um, things are outside of the traditional transferring data from aggregators to portals. Um, and during the workshop, we then reviewed those use cases uh, and we formed smaller breakout groups um, uh, for various specific topics. We had prepared a couple of topics. We were also asking are there other topics that we should cover? And the goal was then to split into those smaller working groups and do the actual work outside of the workshop um, and have first iteration of the results um, done by today. So for the um, virtual conference week uh, for this symposium. Now the workshop itself uh, was quite well attended. 85 people were there, 25 uh, actively participating. Um, the recording of it is on YouTube if you want to listen to the, the entire two hours. Um, depending on your, on your um, language level, you can also uh, increase the speed and, and uh, yeah, listen to the conversation in, in one and a half hours, something like that. So, um, and afterwards, there was also some discussion in the notes document that was already linked. Um, but the main part were the breakout groups. So we had we had initially proposed five different groups. For four of them, there were people who said, oh, I would be interested in working on them. And those groups were um, requirements for future standard and standard development platform. Then gaps in the content that are not yet addressed by ex the existing standards. So closely to what Philippi just uh, mentioned. Um, then the architecture for mapping between standards based on existing mappings or existing solutions for mappings. And then data transformation services, being able to convert formats. So um, we now go into the smaller breakout groups and yeah, have people from the groups actually uh, present the content. And for the first group, uh, Anton is presenting on the requirements for the future standard and standard development. So Anton, uh, do you want to switch to your screen or should we try that I give you control? No, I will let, switch let, to, my, to my screen. Okay, you, you now also have control for my screen. So I, I use the latest version of your slides. Maybe uh, I'm afraid you don't have the latest version. Okay, okay, then, then <laughs> I'm stopping my screen sharing and uh, okay. you go ahead. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. I um, have to find it. Da, da, da. Can you see the presentation? Yeah. Currently in editing mode. OK, so. Now on full screen, yeah. Here you go. So the, the official name of the subgroup was uh, requirements for a future standard and standard development platform. And uh, members were uh, myself, David Fichtmüller, Wouter Edding, John Witscherek, and Peter Winter. And actually, what do we mean by requirements? Why, why are we thinking about, about requirements for, for this alignment activity? Um, the background is that, um, well, initially, people who were involved in this, uh, or who are involved in this alignment activity were very enthusiastic when it started. So when I think Stan Bloom uh, announced the initiative and asked, and asked for help, everybody was really, uh, really positive about it. Um, 
but then um to be honest um it uh the the group became rather silent so to speak and um there are two main reasons for this the first one being the usual one um lack of time nobody has really time to look into these things really deeply uh but uh, more importantly i would say is that um the, the targets for for the alignment activity are really or were at that point uh, really unclear uh were we talking about a common standard standardization platform or are we talking uh, about a mapping between standards are we talking about creating a new ontology for tedwig which has everything in it or what, what is it this alignment and um therefore we thought it really makes sense to step back a little bit and and think about what what really the requirements are from from different perspectives and we try to achieve something in the subgroup with the little time we had um and we try to cover not only technical aspects but also uh, broader needs uh, but i really have to say this is not a structured analysis but rather a summary of discussions uh, uh which really needs uh, to be continued so actually we are we came up with uh five requirements the first one being backward compatibility and um what uh, do we mean by this uh, both abcd and darby core are used productively for a great number of different applications uh, which cover not only the usual gbif biocase uh, data harvesting processes uh, but also very different applications uh, for example the standards provide definitions of uh, data elements in collection management systems and the underlying data models um we used the standards already for interface specifications in scientific workflow systems um uh, many of you or some of you were involved for example in the biovel project uh, led by alex hardesty uh, which made heavily use uh, of of those standards uh they are used for for data capture forms to define fields uh they are used for archiving purposes for example we have a, we have a german uh, biodiversity data initiative which is called gf bio which makes heavily use of abcd um as an archiving format and so forth um so what's what's really important is that future new modeling tools or platforms uh, provide existing infrastructures with with viable migration paths so that they don't get lost so to speak Another thing which needs to be considered is um that existing branding of standards should be maintained because yeah they are used in projects in project proposals and so forth and and should therefore be um uh be considered so to speak. Um requirement 2 is ease of maintenance um here we made the observation that there are hardly any resources to maintain standards centrally so there is no not a team of five people working at tedwick uh maintaining standards but rather um the persons providing contributions uh do this in addition to their main uh, day job usually scientific and have very limited capacities uh for doing this work um so technical hurdles and complex modeling techniques uh should be avoided actually to prevent uh, to not to prevent experts from working on the content um so what does it mean it means actually that modeling methods especially the basic models should be easy to understand and accessible for the domain experts and more complex models should not be seen as part of the basic model but as an optional layer for applications with special requirements um requirement 3 sustainability which is uh related to requirement 2 um standards need resources for their maintenance even after completion so it's not it's not enough to 
complete a standard from that point on it needs attention for example for making corrections um completions uh, for example if if elements are missing uh, for working on the documentation and improving the documentation as well as um, software updates for for the modeling platform if if we are using such a platform and therefore when deciding on modeling methods and modeling platforms the costs for sustainable maintenance must be taken into account so we should avoid expensive framework for doing modeling requirement for user support uh, standards need user support beyond just documentation it's not enough to describe the elements concepts classes and so forth uh, and there should be some kind of help desks where users can di direct their questions for example um, if they want to know how to map their scientific data to the standards um, if they want to learn about the correct definition of concepts and how they should be implemented into software tools but also uh, the other way around to report issues uh, or gaps in standards and in addition we mentioned that the uh, outreach outreach sessions uh, such as the darwin core hours are an incredibly useful uh, and we need these things and finally, um, yeah, David mentioned the, the use case uh, use case exercise we made prior to the workshop, and we we extracted um, five requirements from these uh, use cases. Um, uh, uh, the first one being that each each concept in a standard should be addressable with a URI and has a definition. That's I mean, goes without goes uh, without saying probably. Then um, support for stable identifiers uh, should be there for all classes in the data structures. Uh, we need more controlled vocabularies for elements to increase data quality and interoperability. Uh, we should uh, consider a consensus uh, graph model. This was uh, proposed by uh, Steve Baskov, this requirement. Uh, for the various TEDWIC standards, it's not only about ABCD and Darwin Core, uh, to allow querying data from various sources in the linked data graph. This would be another attempt to the TEDWIC ontology thing, I would say. And finally, um, uh, the possibility to add, to add extensions for special interest groups or use cases outside the initial scope. So standards should have slots which can be used in a flexible way to extend the standards for for certain things and i think that's what we produced in our group so david do you want to take the screen back um Mm, no, maybe not necessarily yet, since we thought we have like a small round of mini questions and mini oh, discussions sorry. after yeah. each of those uh, reports from the working groups. So um, yeah, we, we can thematically focus this a bit instead of having them all at the end, uh, uh, yeah, mixing various discussions. So um, are there any questions or remarks regarding, uh, yeah, the the presentation Anton just gave. In the chat we had a somewhat uh, um, joking, uh, partially jokingly, partially serious discussion on uh, having yeah, paid full-time people at TEDWIC for whose sole purpose is the, the uh, 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 standard maintenance uh, tasks uh, and uh, yeah. Um, of course, everybody wants that there are paid people, and the, the only question is where does the money come from, uh, as as usual. So, so I, I'm afraid I can't answer this question. Yeah, <laughs> I, I guess nobody here can really give a, a satisfying answer to this. Um, so, uh, uh, yeah, are there are there any other remarks or questions uh, to this list? There's a question by Steve. 
Uh, hold on, it's uh, in in the chat or in the Raised document? Raised his hand. Oh, oh, sorry, oh, I, I didn't sorry. see this. <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, go ahead. Well, I actually did also put a, a question in the Google Doc, but um, I was just going to emphasize, I think that um, that what was said about uh, having kind of a, a lightweight model and not getting lost in the weeds with a lot of um, uh, technical details is a good idea. I was I sat through the session on remote sensing where there were a bunch of people um, who were, you know, basically begging for a model that would uh, allow them to to express their data um, from camera traps and things like that. And then soon afterwards, I was at the digital specimens um, group, and they also were developing a like very specimen centric model and I and I asked like are you are you reaching out to this other group because I mean the the problem with Tadwig is that every person thinks that their bit of of the universe is the center of the universe and so when they build models they build a model where their thing either specimens or camera trap pictures or whatever is the center of the universe but they're not really like what we learned about the real earth is there isn't any center of the universe. It's all a bunch of interconnected things. And so I think developing like a very lightweight model, maybe even just a bubble diagram showing the classes and how they're related um, and, and enforcing this across all the different projects is, is really important because, you know, we didn't have that with ABCD and Darwin Core and now we are faced with the situation of trying to reconcile those two things. And I, I just was like, like uh, groaning to think about, we'll have now a digital specimens model that's a third model and a, a fourth model that's for remote sensing and we'll have an even worse job to try to reconcile all of these. Whereas if we had sort of a basic graph model that graph model could be translated into a more formal ontology or to relational database and entity relation diagrams. I mean, there's a lot of ways to turn that into specifics, but if you don't have sort of the overarching model where there is no one thing that's the center of the universe, you're always gonna have trouble later on linking them up. Can I quickly ask, ask back the digital specimens model you are referring to the OpenDS development or is this a yeah. different thing? Uh, yeah, yeah, right. I mean, they're, they're, I mean, they had, they presented a model and it had, of course, specimen in the middle and then all the things related to that. But, uh, you know, if you're taking camera trap pictures, you're recording occurrences that may not have any specimens at all associated with them. And those are occurrences just as much as a specimen is an occurrence. How are you going to relate those two kinds of occurrences when specimens leave the live organism photos out and the live organism people, photo people leave the specimens out? I mean, if you're a person who's doing camera trapping, then a specimen is tangential to your work. If you're a person doing uh, work in a natural history museum, then photos of the live organism are tangential to your work. And, but one of these things is not more important than the other. They're all a part of a larger picture. Uh, David, do I have time for a second question to Steve? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, go ahead. Sorry, but, but um, uh, Steve, the, uh, you said that uh, even a diagram would help. What would these, this diagram actually contain and how would it help? Well, I, I guess what I'm talking about is a graphical representation of a linked data uh, graph. So I'm not talking about a, a formal ontology. I'm just talking about an indication of each class and the links between those classes. Then each class would have particular properties that would be associated with that and you know those parts of the community for whom those classes are their focus could determine exactly what uh, data type properties would be 
appropriate for that class. But in terms of the overall issue of what are the main classes in the model and how are they related to each other, that could be expressed very simply in either uh, a simple JSON LD or, or, or RDF, or even as a picture, because you can translate back and forth between uh, RDF and a picture, which is why I said you could, you could write the picture and I could turn it into RDF. Okay, thank you. Um, there's one other question from uh, Raisa Meyer um, in, in the document or was in the chat as well. Um, from your point on adding extensions for specific interest groups, one example that came to mind was the GSC minimum information for any sequence mix standard. Uh, would this fit and would you know if there were any efforts on the way for such an alignment? Uh, maybe I can answer this. Anton, you feel free to, to add to me. Uh, the, the mixed standard is um, uh, best comparable with the um, GGBN extension for ABCD, uh, or also now the GGBN extensions that are in the process of review for um, Darwin Core. Uh, it was formerly known as the DNA extension for ABCD. And um, we were in, in um, contact with some of the people behind Mix, and there was always this, yeah, we, we should do an alignment. And it's been on our um, list for a couple of years, actually, now, um, uh, especially with the GF Bio project. It was one of the, the uh, things that was suggested by the proposal to be done. Um, that is currently still on hold also due to personal changes, person changes uh, on the uh, mix side. Um, we, we are aware that this is one of the use cases for a, yeah next alignment. And um, I guess this kind of also feeds into the report that I'm going to give later on, on the, the group about the mappings. Does this answer this question so far? I, I see that you had two others. Um, there are no more questions regarding Anton's requirement group. I might just go on because I think they, they, they are currently fit quite well in here and going to combine the, the questions from Raisa. Uh, the, um, what was the motivation behind relaxing the structure of ABCD? Was this needed to add the ontology component? And then uh, from Roger Heim, how does the combined uh, Darwin Core ABCD integrate uh, with the modeling that is uh, going on for the disco digital specimen uh, thing? Um, so first, Aisa, um, uh, with ABCD being this strict XML structure, it was, was really fixed on what we call unit centric model. So the, the unit, um, which could be a specimen or an observation uh, was yeah, the, the core element that everything revolved around. And um, this was really practical in the beginning, but this also reduced the usability quite a lot because um, one of the, the examples we always have, have, if you have a use case where you want to switch the order around. So every unit has a gathering site, for instance. But if you work with plot related data, uh, you might want to group this by a gathering site. So you have one element for the gathering site and then all the units that connect to it. Um, and this is not possible with the classic ABCD XML. And so one idea was yeah, to, to, to break this up into just the, the basic concepts, the gathering site, the unit, the persons, and then connect them uh, via different attributes or uh, different properties. Um, uh, so this would allow then for uh, yeah, a new format that is using the exact same concepts, but in a different order. So putting the gathering site at the top and um, or having, I don't know, a collector's lock format where you put the person in the center and everything related to a person that goes away from there. 
So um, this was one of the use cases. And for this, we, we needed to break this up and also giving the possibility to yeah, reuse concepts from ABCD in a different setting. So kind of like a mix and match, pick and choose. Um, uh, I have a special use case where I need um, uh, certain concepts that are already well-defined within ABCD. Um, and I want to reuse those concepts, but I don't want to be bound by the structure of ABCD. So this was the idea behind the ontology, which now brings us to Roger's question, how does it integrate with the DISCO uh, the digital specimen modeling? So they open the S, open digital specimen. And um, uh, this is one of those use cases where we uh, consider using the concepts from ABCD and Darwin Core without necessarily taking over the, the structure, um, the defined XML format. So. Um, uh, yeah, this is currently in the process of specification. Uh, we are working on this in the DISCO project and I'm involved in the group that is working on this. So we have a close uh, relation there. Um, and yeah, so we are going to reuse certain concepts, um, which is yeah exactly one of the use cases uh, from that, that we intended with breaking up the structure. Did I answer those two questions? David, I think we have to move on. Yeah, now. okay. Oh, yeah, that's... Uh, um, so, um, okay, we, it brings us to... Oh, hold on, I need to share my screen again. Um, brings us to the next breakout group. Um, Matthias is going to present. Hold on. Uh, yeah. And now you have control of my screen. Okay, let's see if this works. Uh, okay, now it's working. Okay, uh, thanks, David. Um, so I'm going to briefly uh, discuss a few topics we covered in this group about the gaps. But I also want to start that we had the same concerns that uh, Anton mentioned, that um, we were however, a bit worried about the unclear targets for this um, alignment effort. So what are the ultimate goals and um, how feasible it is uh, to get there? Um, so the topic of this group was gaps in Darwin Core and or ABCD. And um, we tried to discuss a couple of these. Um, but as we saw in the first presentation of uh, this session of, by Filippi, um, there are also other gaps in these standards, in particular when we discuss um, research data like agrobiodiversity data. Whereas in this group, um, because of our background, we mostly function, uh, mostly focused on um, specimen data once again. But even for these, um, which are very much closely related to the um, inception of these standards, um, there's still quite some gaps. And that kind of raised the question, isn't the student our main focus be to try to uh, close these gaps before um, we go for the actual, stick, actual steps towards unifying both standards? So the first thing we looked at is what kind of specimen that we are dealing with. Um, that's to say its current state, how it got this way, any chemicals that are present, but more specifically, um, how do we consistently identify a certain kind of preserved specimen, what we are dealing with? In Darwin Core, we have a preparations term that we could use, but this is free text and it can contain all sorts of things, making it rather difficult, for instance, if you want to find all sorts of herbarium sheets, binned insects, liquid samples, or any other particular um, kind of specimen this way. So, um, in CMS's um, collection management systems, we often find that there's quite some complex models to touch all these different kinds of objects. And this is way too complex to actually implement ever in, in, in Darwin Core. But we think one of the gaps to move forward would be to um, come up with a very simple uh, vocabulary that would at least allow us to identify the most common of these um, specimen types. Uh, second, and this is also a category that has been um, discussed quite a lot in um, these standards for years, is uh, what to do with verbatim data. That is, 
data, literally as it occurs on the label or any other documentation related to the physical objects. And um, in both standards, some of these verbatim terms occur, verbatim terms for locality coordinates, um, the person collecting the, uh, the object. But there's a distinction, and this is becoming more important in the recent years, between um, the structured type of verbatim data, as I just mentioned, and the raw verbatim data, the exact text not classified in any sort of property type of what is present on the label. This is particularly interesting when we try to optimize or some automated methods to capture this text in the future. And we may also think of other use cases. For instance, if we have this raw text not classified, we can use it to estimate how well digitized a certain specimen is. Because if there's a lot of potentially useful text and we don't see this represented in the structured data, then the state of digitization is probably quite low. Um, then this was probably the most discussed issue in our group. So what do we do with curatorial info about specimens? Um, this is currently more common in ABCD than Darwin Core, but this is the case for most terms because ABCD has much more terms. But um, the question really is, are these within the scope of the standards? Um, and the point was raised that as these are mostly irrelevant for scientific questions, for research questions, they can be quite variable if you think about management activities and they're unlikely to be updated on a regular uh, time scale, then they might not be in the scope. But on the other hand, we've seen increasingly the problem of interoperability between, between the data as it is published and it, as it occurs in our collection management systems. You see increased use cases for, the, for directly connecting to these systems. For, for instance, in, in Europe now, we have development of the European loans and visits system which probably does require um, some access to these types of in, to this type of information. And um, so this kind of, this poses the point that at least these standards should provide support for these kinds of, of, of information types. And another, I think very important uh, use case is data migration, which is right now still often the bottleneck when we think about um, keeping our systems and our data management up to date. And if you want to facilitate and, and, and make it less painful in the future, we need to think about keeping our the data with this within our systems as close as we can to the data that we actually use for external research use. And finally, um, what do we do with uh, data that is absent or missing? Because this can have different meanings depending on, on um, the cause of this absence. So data can be just, we don't know it, it is missing and we tried to find it, but we couldn't. But it could also be that we failed to determine the actual nature of the data because we couldn't decipher it. But it could also be the case that we just really didn't do any effort at all to try and digitize it. So it may be just very well out there, which is an important distinction when you think about the state of digitization, but also how useful these specimens, these which are representations of occurrence records, how useful they can potentially be for various types of scientific use. Um, and for instance, a field where it's very well, very important to know um, what the, uh, whether what kind of unknown it is, is type status. Um, if a specimen is a type and it is indicated, then it's very easy to find out, yes, sir, it's a type. But for most specimens, the data will be absent, and then we don't know is this not a type or did somebody just not bother to check whether it was one. And um, there are a few other topics that we discussed, but I think these ones I did I uh, talked about before were the most important ones, and we are running a bit against time, so I'll I'll leave these be for now. So, are there any questions? So as far as I can see, there are no questions yet. In... There's one, oh, one oh, question there, there's one in, in the writing. <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah. 
Uh, okay, uh, so the question is, um, uh, say we want to adopt the use of controlled vocabularies for missing data. How do we actively promote adoption of it? Um, I think at, at this point, it's, it's kind of, it's also a bit of a technical obstacle because all, we have various systems in place and they all have different ways of representing missing information, and including these different types of missing information that I talked about. But a starting point, I think, would be is if the main publishers, the main aggregators start to um, recommending this. It, it's obviously that's something that we can't mandate, but it is something that I feel will be come more widespread as soon as some big contributors just start doing it. And I think the chief obstacle is, because uh, I saw just what, what Elspeth said, is one of the, the, the technical or at least the, the perceived technical problems with implementing this approach. You can also imagine that if we use these, these vocabularies that were suggested uh, before, um, this would also just take a lot of unnecessary um, storage space for no reason. But those are technical things that we can address. The main um, point to make with this a known distinction is that we need to find a way that we can actually represent what missing data means, because otherwise we are just actively creating confusion and um, creating just, um, well, misinterpretations and we make it much more difficult for ourselves to know the status of our current data and for the researchers who want to use this data to find out just what exactly is available for them. So maybe we could, this could be part of a kind of certification of data providers, whether you um, support and, and implement s such standards, for example, for missing data, but there are other examples as well, which, which um, heavily influence the quality and, and usability of your, your data, I would say. This uh, makes me think maybe there's something we could give to the to the MITS group, yeah. uh, Elspeth, and uh, yeah, uh, Elspeth just wrote it. Uh, so um, that uh, yeah, uh, it certainly forms a key part in the MITS framework uh, that Elspeth just wrote in in the chat. So um, uh, yeah, so for certain MITS level, then having those explicit negative statements uh, becomes a requirement or at least a suggestion but i yeah i guess it's um uh it's also an issue of just culture because people are just not used to thinking in those negative expressions and it's um saying that's uh, yeah uh, explicitly stating every information that is not given uh, uh seems like an yeah um unnecessary task uh, when you're not considering all of that the use cases for querying for things so um, I guess this is, of course, it's always easy to, to, to point to, to others and saying, okay, this is task of the, the uh, collection management systems for providing good interfaces that, that yeah, lets you easily, yeah, I don't know, have, have a, some kind of gray box that you can turn into a, a plus or, or minus for confirmed or not present or something like that. Uh, and by default, it's the, the yeah undefined status. All right. Um, so uh, I guess we, yeah, this uh, uh, brings us now to the next working group. If there are no other questions uh, for Matthias, uh, I don't think I missed any. Um, so that, uh, yeah, I'm going to report on the group that uh, was uh, taking care of the, the mapping between standards. Um, this group uh, uh, didn't really produce much, mainly due to time and personal constraints. So I, I took over here and uh, added some of the, the information we already collected during the session and extended on it, to be honest, a bit from, from ABCD perspective, but I, I tried to, to cover uh, down core as well. So um, first we collected what are existing mappings. Um, there are uh, yeah, mappings already out there, of course. Um, 
uh, and for instance, the, the mappings in Darwin Core are in the Darwin Core term list. Uh, hold on, let me open that window. So the, the link, if you, if you open the link here, you will find this uh, CSV document. And if you, um, this is rendered by GitHub, so it's usually not that nice table, but just a regular CSV file. And if you scroll all the way over here, somewhere around here, is the column uh, Tedvik Utility ABCD equivalence. We already see a lot of them are not in ABCD and for others we see the X path. And um, uh, so uh, we have the mappings to the ABCD to X paths and I just ran a little analysis of the um, 280 terms, um, 160, 76 terms do have a mapping. The others with the no mappings are either where it's as explicitly stated, uh, no ABCD uh, equivalence or just no, uh, no value at all. Again, bringing us back to the question of uh, explicit negative statement or um, no statement given. And of those, um, I have, we have a bit over 50, but I have here as, oh, as sorry. Oh, my mouse, uh, but I have here as um, text content. Um, so what do I mean by this? Well, if, if we look in, in the field here, uh, no, where do we have a good example? Um, here we, uh, we see one where we have um, several X paths combined with an OR. So I just checked, is this just a full valid X path or are there spaces? This was my, my simple test. So. Uh, those are uh, some kind of combination or um, yeah, conditions, things like that, uh, restrictions uh, beyond just the X path in that field. So it's, it's not uh, machine processable. Um, and we have some that are what I call restrictions. Those are um, links to control vocabularies within uh, the XML schema. Um, not really valid X paths, but mapping to the concepts. Uh, so yeah, something of a special case. And we have 127 X path and of those uh, 95 are actually valid uh, that pointing to an element within in the XML tree. 22 are not valid. Some of them I saw capitalization issues. I didn't really look into those. Um, which kind of gives you an, an understanding what, what we have here. Uh, on the other side, on for ABCD3, um, for those who don't know, we did the modeling for the ABCD3 ontology in a Wikibase instance. And within the Wikibase instance, uh, you can run the query service. Uh, and I have a Sparkle query here that shows me all of the concepts that we have in there that map to an external um, URI either as has exact match or has related match. So those are um, yeah, um, identical to the SCOS concepts um, with the same name. And uh, so we had a lot of mappings here to the um, uh, Darwin core terms. Now um, uh, we have about 80 mappings, 42 show to Darwin core terms. Some others go to Dublin Core, friend of friend, geo names, um, W3C, geo, and vcard. Uh, and as you can see, only 42, this also is not really complete, partially because uh, of the yeah, breaking down of the structure. Um, uh, so, for instance, when we have um, in Dublin Core, we have um, taxon identifier. Um, we ha now have uh, the taxon class and an um, ID property that are combined within ABCD, but we can within the wiki base, we have only the ID field. And so we cannot uh, do, do a direct mapping to the um, concept within Darwin Core. Uh, that kind of limits the number of concepts where we can do a proper mapping on. And then we also have a mapping between ABCD 2X path and ABCD 3X path. These are actually um, uh, 
quite extensive. So um, if you go on the ABC documentation page and then about the, the changes that are new for ABC D3, and then at the bottom you have um, the, the mapping table and you see all of the, the X paths you know, here in a, in a pretty small window and which one were added, which one were changed, uh, which one uh, which were removed, and then uh, yeah, those that don't have any changes. And of course, if, if you're looking for, for a particular group of, of elements, you can just uh, um, type the name. So if I type taxon, it will automatically filter all of the ones that have taxon in the name. Um, so that's what we have for mappings. What else do we have uh, in, we, we try to do the mapping between the ABCD2 X paths and the ABCD3 concepts. Um, so this is uh, kind of tricky because we need, as I just said, we, we have those different fragments that we then combine to the concepts. So we need intermediate concept mappings for this. What do I mean by this? Let's take for instance, the country name. So um, in, ABCD3 country is a class and name is a property uh, that is used in, for different classes. So focusing on reusability of concepts. So we now need to define a mapping class, well, mapping concept uh, country name, which we define as a class country that is having the data type property name. And with that, we could then uh, do the mappings either to the ABCD X path or to um, Darwin Core as well. Uh, the similar things for other classes. So owner is um, the owner of a data set is a person who is uh, referenced via the object property has owner from the data set class. Um, there are kind of complex rules for RDF to specify those relations. Um, but yeah, this kind of approach brings some problems with it. As you already noticed, it's a bit complicated, but I just showed you where still some simplifications um, of what we do internally. It's not complete. There are still some mappings missing, partially due to the structure we, we did then the mappings to XML. I'm not going to into as much detail as it's right now here. Um, and uh, we don't have any mappings to the external concepts yet. So as I said, with the country name, we could do the mapping to Darwin core country name. We haven't done those yet, uh, but at least the, the structure is there. What other mappings exist? Well, the, we, we saw uh, yesterday, day before yesterday, in, in the talk about MITs, um, we have the, the MITs table and in there we have uh, columns for uh, Darwin Core and ABCD3. So uh, we, yeah, a lot of people have thought about mappings uh, and I guess if, if we collect all of them, we might get a somewhat extensive picture that is yeah, better than, than each individual mapping. Um, but there are certainly other mappings as well. Some are somewhere yeah, implicitly hidden within existing software that just uses elements from uh, both formats and um, so knows, okay, if I want to pick something here and need to, to look over there. Um, uh, and maybe there are other mappings that we are not aware of. So if you know any, then um, yeah, please let us know. Uh, so that um, yeah, brings us to our analysis. Um, uh, what are the problems with the existing mappings? Well, they are kind of hard to find, as you saw. Um, you really need to know that you need to look at the outer column within the um, CSV file, or that you need to write a specific query for the Sparkle endpoint. There's no standardized way of expressing mappings, um, especially with the special cases, like yeah, the, the one-to-many mappings. There, sometimes it's not clear how to, to map them to each other. Um, then um, we have conditional mappings. So for instance, the Darwin core element for order, taxonomic rank, um, uh, is mapped to an ABCD higher taxon, higher taxon name, so the, the content, if the higher taxon rank set to order. Um, there are other cases where we have close but not really exact mappings. And then that brings us to discussion when 
are they close enough to say, okay, we use the exact mapping property or when it's just related? And I guess there's also a discussion between the, the pragmatists that saying, okay, it's close enough. And the, the people who are more on the, on the, on the structured uh, theoretical side saying, okay, they have to really uh, map. And then of course, as we always saw, a lot of those mappings are incomplete. Now, what can be done to improve them? Well, first of all, we need to make the mappings we already have more accessible. So people who work with both standards or software systems that work with both standards know how to get the elements from either one and know how to yeah, get the, the equivalent uh, concepts. Uh, there should be central place either on the TEDBIC website or on the websites of the various standards. Um, I could imagine that we could also make this part of the standard documentation. That, that's, there is a section for mappings to other standards that should be listed. Um, maybe then also with a common format or, or a standardized notation. Um, I don't really think it's possible or, or to do this machine readable um, because this requires to, to formulate all of those special rules, but just a common format that even a human user, a programmer who is implementing this in, in some kind of uh, export system uh, knows how to handle them. Um, we need to validate the existing mappings are there any issues? Uh, are they still up to date? Maybe things have changed. And we need to extend the existing mappings, especially to include the extensions because for, um, besides Audubon Core, I think we don't have any mappings from ABCD3 to, uh, um, to any of the other Darwin Core extensions. David, we are running yeah. out of time. Yeah, Sorry. I, I'm, 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 uh, yeah. so th this is the, uh, uh, what I have for the mappings working group. Um, are there any questions about that? Very quick question. Yeah. So John Victoric wrote, one of the remaining tasks for the chronometric age task group is to map terms between those chrono namespace and those in EFG. It's an easy way to determine those mappings. Um, I, I don't know. Um, Maybe this is something that um, maybe Mareike for EFG can answer, but um, uh, no, I, I don't. I don't know any. Mm. Okay, so I think we have to move on. Okay. To to York's presentation. Yeah. So then, hold on. Um, which brings us to the last working group. Oh. And you, you have now control over my screen. Okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I have to hurry, I guess. Um, this was a very small um, group with just um, two uh, members. And, and so we decided to um, give some practical, uh, some of our practical experiences with um, working with transforming ABCD from ABCD to Darwin Core. Um, so I will rush through. Um, the origin for this has been something I developed for the Biotest provider software, um, which produces ABCD archives, and I wanted to have them transferred into Darwin Core archives. Um, this will be soon available as a um, standalone service. Um, this will be done by the GFBio project. And yeah, it uses, um, um, under the hood, it uses the Pentaho Kettle library. Um, so I just want to show four or five of the main issues um, we or I encountered when I um, developed this transformation. Of course, when we're talking about mappings, we think it's nice to have um, one concept in ABCD and one element in, in Darwin Core, like the catalog number, which just map, uh, maps exactly. But um, since there are different approaches um, for storing um, data in ABCD compared to Darwin Core, in many cases, you can't um, do a one-to-one -one, um, mapping. So of course, one of the main problems is, is that ABCD is very specialized. The standard um, version two has about 900 elements, lead elements that really can store data. So it has many very specialized subtrees like botanical garden unit, which don't have any equivalent in, in, in Darwin Core. So all these data will be lost when you transfer it into Darwin Core, of course very obvious. 
Um, the second thing is that um, since ABCD makes um, use of repeatable elements at very often in, in, in often places, um, or the other way around, um, Darwin core is flat. So um, for many elements, you have to provide data in a concatenated way. For example, if you look at the recorded by um, element, you have to provide um, a collector team um, separated by um, semicolon or some, some certain character. In ABCD, you can provide them individually. Um, you can just can repeat um, the XML um, subtree gathering agent. So if you transfer data from ABCD to Darwin Core, you have to concatenate them. If you have the multiple collectors, or if you do it the other way around, you have to um, pass them and separate them. Um, Yeah. Um, luckily enough, or um, unfortunately enough, as you see it, um, ABCD also has, in addition to the um, repeatable element for the gathering agent, you have one element that can hold um, the concatenated version. So if you want to transfer data from ABCD to Darwin Core, it's very easy. You can um, put those concatenated value um, into this um, ABCD element for the concatenated um, storage, but the other way around, it gets difficult if, um, if, if both fields are filled. So what do you do? Do you concatenate the, the individual agents and then you append the concatenated version or do you just take one? You don't know what's inside. So um, it's, um, it's very difficult if you don't know how the, the users use ABCD and provide data in, in different formats. Um, one of the core um, elements of ABCD is the idea of a variable atomization. So this is just the tree, the subtree for one gathering agent. You can provide it as a single element, as a full name, or you can provide the individual components of the name and you can, in addition, provide an organization. So if you want to convert these data items, into ABC uh, into Darwin Core into one field recorded by in Darwin Core. There's a lot of concatenation going on. If then else statements, um, yeah, and you finally end up in something that looks like um, a gathering team, like a recorded by team in Darwin Core um, archives. Um, another thing which is greatly different between ABCD and Darwin Core are how hierarchies are handled. For example, the higher classification in um, Darwin Core, each of the levels has one separate element. In, in ABCD, you have just two um, concepts, name and rank, and you can repeat them as tuples over and over again to provide the different um, levels of a hierarchy. Um, if you want to convert these data, you have to, to pivot them. You have to turn rows into, into columns and vice versa. And um, depending on the type of hierarchy, this might be um, not possible without data loss. For example, if you want to create, uh, in, in this case of the higher taxonomy, if you want to transfer the data from Darwin Core into ABCD, you're fine. But the other way around, um, you might lose some of the levels because if you look at the at the ranks given, you have something like suborder or um, subclasses in, in ABCD, which you don't have in Darwin Core. So um, you can do the pivoting, but um, in many cases you will lose some of the of the um, levels of the hierarchy. So um, as a short summary, you can transfer or you can convert data from ABCD to Darwin Core and vice versa. Um, you end up with a lot of if then else constructs because you have so many elements in ABCD um, and so few in Darwin Core. You have to concatenate, you have to pass and, and split sometimes, you have to do pivoting. And um, just as a short idea, this is what um, the Darwin Core to or the ABCD to Darwin Core transformation looks like um, in Kettle in Pentaho. So each of the nodes uh, is one transformation step, something like um, an if then else construct or like a concatenation or a translation of a vocabulary term. And 
yeah, you can see there's a lot of um, of stuff going on just to to be able to transfer the data from those fields where there's no exact one-to-one -one mapping. So it is a bit complicated. It was very fast. I hope it was helpful anyway. David? Oh no, back to Anton. Um, thank you, Jörg. I'm deeply impressed by the transformation diagram, I must say. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> and uh, un unfortunately, we are running out of time a little bit. Actually, we had, we had planned for um, uh, for a, for a, another discussion round at the end of the meeting, but we had all, we had a lot of discussions uh, in the meeting, and um, I think that uh, this discussion has to be continued. Um, definitely, the alignment group will have to meet during the coming weeks or months. Uh, and and on quickly, you, you're sharing your other screen now. You're sharing the one with the document. Oh, sorry. The one sorry. Um, bu -bu -bu -bu. I guess you need to stop the screen sharing and start it again with the other screen. Yeah, sorry. So once more. Um, Here we go. So that's the right one now, right? Yeah. Okay. So anyway, we don't. Uh, I I had compiled a list of questions which I actually wanted to discuss at the end of the session, but uh, we can't unfortunately. But uh, maybe you can have a quick look at them. Um, keep them in your heart. T take them away as a homework, and we will meet. Uh, um, soon, I guess, with the with the alignment group, which, which is not yet a formal TEDWIC group, I have to say. So that's something we need to consider. Um, at this point, I will uh, thank all the speakers for the really interesting presentations and uh, and inspiring uh, discussions. All the the participants who contributed to the session. Uh, it was really a great discussion, I think. Um, if you want to become involved in the working group, uh, we would, of course, appreciate that very much. Uh, please uh, uh, contact us or, or put a note into the, uh, into the notes file <laughs> of the meeting. Um, um, I have to thank once more um, David, Jörg, Mareike, and Brenda for running this and supporting this um and uh yeah and enjoy the remaining tetwick program and uh see you soon hopefully um one j just a few more remarks from from my side so uh yeah um again if if you want to join um the you you're more than welcome please add your uh, yeah, name or add, add a remark uh in in the Google Docs next to your name. Um, also, uh, of course, we, we forgot to mention Beatrice, who is running the, the session as, as the TEDVIC executive. So thank you to your uh, course as well. And as for the presentation of Jörg, as Jörg mentioned, uh, within the um, GFI project, this service will become uh, publicly available uh, via web API. Um, so uh, once this is done, um, we will send around uh, uh, an email probably to, to the TEDRIC mailing list or uh, to, to those who left their emails here within the document uh, uh, to, to announce that this is now available. So if you ever need to convert ABCD files to Darwin Core archive files, you would then have a place to do so um, and don't have to worry about all this, this heavy mapping. And last but not least, I mean, we uh, the, the time is now over for this session, but the next session is only starting in, um, in one and a half hours here. Um, so uh, um, I still have time if anybody else wants, wants to, to continue the discussion, we don't have to leave the room right now. Uh, we will save the chat in, in the document um, 
uh, at the end of the session and uh, yeah uh, hopefully we can dis discuss the uh, 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 yeah continue the discussion there okay bye bye thank you